Hello, everybody. This is Peter Cooper from the NCBI. Uh, we're going to start the webinar now. Today, this is going to be about NCBI resources for agricultural research. Ben Busby, who's also presenting with me, will be here manning the question spot. Also, Wayne Matten. So they can answer some basic questions in there while you're while we're going along. And then at the end, if there's time, we can answer some more sub substantive questions. If we get questions, they're going to be available um, linked to our webinars page, um, along with the uh, link to the YouTube channel. The materials for this talk are on our FTP site, and that compressed URL will lead you to that FTP site. So there are two people presenting there. We're in sort of not in any particular order except chronological. I'm going to go first. I'm Peter Cooper. Uh, I'm with the education group here at NCBI, and then Ben's going to talk. He is um, the uh, genomics outreach coordinator at NCBI. And so. Basically, what we're going to do is talk about the basic search systems at NCBI, tools and databases that are for everything, but we're going to focus on agricultural uh, relevant organisms. Um, and then I'm going to do a demo on the web um, using some examples from cow and using an example from a plant, um, linking across a bunch of the different NCBI databases. Then Ben is going to take over and he's going to talk about more bioinformatics types of resources which require things like command line access and other types of things like that. Um, and so those are the topics that he's going to talk about. So just before we uh, begin, I wanted to show you a slide which didn't format very well when I crossed the platforms here. Essentially, just to make you aware that we have a lot of uh, data available for organisms that are not strictly human. Um, these are some agriculturally important organisms, cow, sheep, pig, chicken, honeybee, rice, maize, sorghum, um, we have completely annotated genomes for these organisms. We have genes, transcripts, proteins, and mapped uh, SNPs available for each one of these. And this is just a selected set. There are others where we also have a lot of data. And so when we're looking at data at NCBI, it's useful, I think, to think about um, three different sets or aspects of the data. There's biomedical literature, and that's our PubMed resource. There's also the Full Text PubMed Central and our Full Text Online Bookshelf. Then there are molecular databases, which are the ones that I'm going to focus on today. They have things like sequences and structures and variation, and even chemicals, if you want. And then the last set are things that have to do with clinical and medical genetics, and those are focused exclusively on human health and disease, not on animals or plants. Um, and if we want to break them down a little bit more, you can sort of break them down into these categories, literature, sequences, expression, uh, variation, protein and nucleic acid structures, and then the clinical genetics things that we talked about a minute ago. We're going to visit a lot of these molecular databases today. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use some search services and tools. There are two main ones. Um, there's Entree, which is the general text search system um, that also includes these databases that will let you see records. Associated with that are some viewers. The Graphical Sequence Viewer, we're going to use that today to look at some genomic sequences. Um, there is a variation viewer that's really set up for mouse and human right now. Um, structure viewers, there is an old-fashioned one you can download called CN3D. And today I'm going to show a structure. I'm going to use iCN3D, which is a web-based application. So it runs right in your browser. You don't need to download anything. So Entree is a tech search uh, system service. Blast is the other way of getting into our databases, and that's using sequence similarity search. The number of different kinds of Blast. Uh, today, in my portion of the talk, we're going to talk about basic BLAST. We're going to use basic BLAST, really. We're not going to talk a whole lot about how it works uh, to find homologs. Ben's going to probably do some talking about SRA BLAST, which is looking at next-gen sequencing data. And the other alignment tool that I'm going to show you today is Primer BLAST, which is a very use for, useful tool for designing primers um, for DNA sequences. And I'm going to show you that with a genomic sequence. So the Entree system is available from our homepage. Um, you can search. 39 databases there. Um, these databases are integrated in the sense that they're connected to each other. If you find a record in one, you can link to records in other databases, and I'll show you that today. There's a, a basic interface, and here's the basic interface uh, for nucleotide, which is a complex Boolean-type query. Um, I could construct a query like that through the advanced interface. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, just to show you a little bit of the structure of the web pages. There tend to be filters on the left-hand side that will let you filter by different properties of the particular records you're looking at. For example, here you get sequence length, publication date, modification date, 
Uh, there's also a thing that we've called the discovery column, which is present on the search results and also present on the records that lets you get access to analyses and related data. So here's a complex Boolean query that you can construct using the next interface. And I'm going to show you which is the advanced interface. And here I'm showing you the advanced interface from BioProject. All these advanced interfaces work the same way for the different entree databases. I just wanted to show you this particular field search here in uh, BioProject, and that's agricultural relevance, which is a way of uh, getting projects that have that kind of relevance assigned to them by their submitters. And that's a useful term if you're looking for things like that. Here's the Andre system in a way that you can search all the databases at once. And the question that you often come across when you're doing this is, where do you start with all these different databases? Well, I just want to point out that there are some central resources that really are the best places to start. And you can link out to the other ones to get the data you want. So PubMed, our taxonomy database, BioProject, Assembly, and Gene. And for my examples, we're going to start and, uh, in Gene and link out to some other kinds of data. Gene is useful for lots of different reasons. Um, one of the things that's really good about it is it's very simple to search. Um, you can search for a specific gene with this a very simple query with the symbol and the organism name. Um, for example, there's a, a way of finding five lipoxygenase for horse. Um, or you can down, get all the genes for a particular organism and just by making sure you have the current only filter. That's on by default in the web anyway. Um, and then at the top of this slide, there's this screenshot of something that we call the gene sensor, which is much more active for things like human. But you can also specify an organism like horse in this case. You can get some um, direct access to the gene record and also PubMed articles that are attached to that gene record. And I'll use that as a way to get into the databases today. So this is sort of a diagram of the entree system that is kind of complicated. But it shows you gene as sort of the central hub. And starting there makes things a lot easier if you're interested in particular genes and their products or things associated with genes. And so you can link out, as it shows here, to these other databases um, to find sequences, literature, variation, homologs on other species, expression information, and structures. OK, so what I want to do now is do some uh, quick live demos. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a gene from cow. Um, DGAT1, we'll find some reference sequences for that. We'll design primers for an exon of that gene. We'll look at some expression resources, Unigene and RNA-seq data. And Ben's going to talk more about RNA-seq in his portion of the talk. Um, GeoProfiles is listed there simply because that's a commonly used expression resource, but we won't be using it for that gene. I'm going to use it for an Arabidopsis gene in the second part of the demonstration that I want to do. Uh, we'll find some homologs using homology in the annotation pipeline. And of course, we could do that using BLAST. Again, I'm going to save that for uh, the plant genes. So I'm going to, on the second part of my demo, I'm going to look at, look at the leafy gene, which is a transcriptor, transcription factor in Arabidopsis. We'll use that to look at geoprofiles. We'll also find homologs using BLAST. And finally, we'll display a structure of that particular protein product. So I want to stop here uh, and exit the um, slides show. And I'm going to launch a web browser here. And I'm going to go to a new tab. And I'm just going to go to NCBI. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the PubMed database. And I'm going to um, search for a particular gene. DAGT1. And I'm going to type the name of an organism after that. The name I'm going to type is cow. Yes, and I keep doing this to myself. I think I'm getting dyslexic. DGAT1. Ah, that worked a little bit better. So that's the that's a gene name. And so the, the gene sensor, which is that box that you're seeing at the top, recognize that as a gene name. And it gave me access to the gene database. That's the second line in that box. Top line gives me a selected set of articles about the DGAT gene function that are linked to that um, gene record. And if we just scroll down through these a little bit here,
You'll notice that there are several of them that talk about a particular polymorphism, which is a lysine 232 alanine polymorphism. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. We're going to look at that particular thing in the gene record. So what I can do now is go to the top of the gene sensor, and I can click through to the gene record for cow for this uh, diacylglycerol oase transferase gene in the gene database. So this is a gene record. Um, it's a typical looking one for sort of a non-model organism like cow. Um, human one would be more extensive, but this still has a lot of information on it. You can scroll through here and you can see there are lots of things here. We're going to focus on a few aspects of this. We're going to look at sequences. We'll take a look at some expression information, some variation. And we'll mess around a little bit with the graphical sequence viewer, which is that object that's embedded in the center of the gene record here that has lots of details about this region of the cow genome. And you can see we're looking at chromosome 14. Um, the annotation release here gives you the current uh, annotation on the cow genome. That goes to our uh, eukaryotic genome annotation page. And this gives you information about the assembly, and that's where you would go to download this if you wanted to get this, these data. So the first thing I want to do is to just show you some of the sequences that are here. And I'm going to use this um, shortcut here to jump down to the reference sequences section. Um, and there are two kinds of sequences typically in one of these eukaryotic genome pages. There are those that are so-called maintained independently of the annotated genomes. So these are based on sequences that we have in our primary sequence database called GenBank. In this case, we have a single transcript aligned to the genome and its corresponding protein translation. In a few minutes, we'll talk about um, the gene model sequences that are based on the RNA-seq data. There are none present in this particular record, but there are in some nearby genes. There are two assemblies here. Uh, they both use the same underlying data. We use the, uh, the University of Maryland 3.11 assembly to annotate. And so that's our so-called reference genome. So to focus on these sequences and their annotations, well, I'm going to go to the center here and look at the graphical sequence viewer. At the top is a line representing the genome sequence. You'll notice this black region here. That's because that's missing data. So there's some missing data right there in this region of the cow genome. Here's our annotation of the cow genome based on alignment of that messenger RNA sequence. We have the ensemble transcript aligned here too. We have some variations. We have these RNA-seq tracks which show you the alignment of RNA-seq data that's coming from our SRA database. We use these um, extensively in our annotation of the genome. We can uh, change the way this looks a little bit if we want to. I'm going to click on the top of the gene track, and I'm going to change this so that we're seeing everything. So I'm going to show all. I'm also going to project the SNPs onto this. So now I can see the corresponding transcript and the protein translation of that transcript. Um, you'll notice that it's incomplete at the 5 prime end and the three prime end. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to use a feature of this to find that particular um, variant that we saw in PubMed. And I've got a little scratch pad here where I've written this down as what's called a Human Genome Variation Society notation. And I can actually find this protein position. This is alanine at position 232 of this protein sequence, which is our RefC protein in the graphical sequence viewer. So I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard. And I'm going to search for it. I clicked on that magnifying glass to, in, to activate the search feature. And voila, it is now landed on the genome at a particular place. And we're going to use this particular piece of information to do some things. For example, this is a variant that affects, <clears throat> if you re read some of those articles, this variant um, affects the quality and the quantity of the milk produced by these cows. So it's an interesting variation from an animal husbandry point of view and from a dairy farming point of view. Um, so it would be interesting, for example, to assay this. The way you might do that is by PCR. So what I want to do is we're going to take this particular exon. You can see that that's an exon. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to do that. And if you count the exons of this gene, 
that happens to be number eight from the five prime end. So what I want to do is um, show you a way to design primers for that particular exon. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a different window over here and the same gene, but just so I don't lose my marker that's in this particular view here. So here's the same gene, and I'm going to change the report here from full report to gene table. So this gives me a blow-by-blow -blow description, if I expand this exon table, of the exon intron structure of the gene. And any of these links will let me load that. So if I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, this is the exon that I want. So I'm now leaving gene, and I'm going to the um, nucleotide database. I can take this piece of DNA and I can load it into Primer Blast. If I follow this link here that says Pick Primers, that's what that will do for me. So what I can do is <clears throat> adjust the coordinates here to get a little bit of the upstream sequence if I want. So 100 bases upstream of this. Likewise, I want to go beyond the end of this. So I can adjust the end of this region too. And then I just want to go down here to pick the background database. So it's going to basically design primers that are specific to this particular piece of genomic DNA. So I want to change my database here to um, the reference assembly. So this will search the cow uh, reference assembly. And that's what this uh, organism identifier here is. Um, and it will give me specific primers. Now, it takes a minute or two to run that, so I'm actually going to load my results to this little tab here, this little link here. And I've saved these results from this morning. Now, it warns me that my Primers may not be specific, and you can take a look and see what that is all about. You can see that there are other places that these match in the genome, but they've got a number of mismatches. So if I'm fairly stringent about this, this should work just fine. Uh, I notice I have a number of options for primer pairs that I could use to amplify this particular exon in the, from the cow genome if I was trying to assay a particular uh, cow, whether they carried this particular polymorphism or not, I could do that. Okay. So let's go back over here to the um, gene again. And so now what I want to do is let's take a little bit more and look at close look at that particular position in the genome. So I can go back to my marker. I can zoom to the sequence at the marker. And now I'm zoomed in quite far, and I can see the alanine codon that's there in the reference genome. You notice that it's mapped onto um, the protein here. Um, one thing that, to notice about this is that we have we don't have this particular variant in the database. We do have uh, one here that changes the alanine to a threonine, but we don't have the one that changes the alanine to a lysine. dbSNP, our database variations, is a submission-driven variant, a variation database. We have a lot of cow SNPs. We have about 94 million of them at this point, but we don't have this particular one. Okay, so we could from here, of course, link into the SNP database through these through the ref SNP ID. I'm not going to bother to show you that right now, but you could go there and learn more about what SNPs we have for this particular record by following the links here to SNP or to GeneView, which gives you some more detailed information about how these SNPs map onto the protein. And that information uh, is shown here. It tells you that it's going to change that alanine to a threonine by mouse over this particular graphic object here. Okay. So the next thing I want to address a little bit is sequence variation. There are a couple of different resources linked here that, that tell you about sequence variation that are in other databases. One of them is Unigene. One of them is GeoProfiles, which are based on microarray data. And then the other one is actually right here in the graphical sequence viewer, which is the alignment of these RNA-seq um, data. Let me just go ahead and I'm just going to click on the gene here and click on that little magnifying glass and it will zoom me back out to where I want to be. 
So the first one I want to visit is an old-fashioned database. It's no longer being developed. It's Unigene, but it's still useful for a lot of organisms, even cow in this particular case. So I'm going to open that in a new tab to show you what happens. This is a cluster based on um, old-fashioned EST sequences, which are first-pass single-read sequences from cDNA libraries from various tissues. Um, we have two traditional types of sequences in here, plus 93 EST sequences. You can basically count the sequences that are coming from particular libraries to get an EST profile out of this. I can show you one right here. Um, it's not a whole lot of sequences for the cow gene, and there's not a tremendous amount of cDNA libraries in terms of numbers compared to, say, human, but you can get the impression that this gene is expressed in lots of different tissues. In particular, it seems to be highly expressed in, in intestine. And if you want to, to see the corresponding gene in human, you could do that in Unigene. And you'd see that there are a lot more cDNA libraries available. <clears throat> the other source of data of information would be geo profiles, but there's not a whole lot of um, curated profiles for cow. Um, Ben's going to talk a little bit later on about um, RNA-seq data, and that would be a source of expression information that you could analyze yourself. We have aligned some of that to the cow genome. You can see that down here. Okay. Uh, and so these are the uh, aggregates here. If I wanted to add something else, other tissues, I can do that by going up here to the tracks menu. I'll click on that. I'll click on configure tracks. Uh, notice that there are expression tracks available. What's up there now is the aggregate. I can just search tracks. Suppose I wanted to add, for example, a track from liver. So I'm just going to search for liver. So there's some liver tracks there. I could search. These are the exon coverage, which is basically the alignments. The intron spanning reads are very useful for um, trying to figure out what the various splice variants are. So let me just go ahead and add the liver track here. And you can add more if you want to to see what the various expression profiles are like. And so this is what liver looks like, two different samples. And you can compare expression in sort of a, a rough way here by just looking at the heights of these peaks. Notice that they're, they give you a scale here. So I could put another tissue up there and see, for example, if I expected higher level expression. Um, notice that these are, uh, at this point, these are log-based, uh, log two-based um, scales here. So remember that the, the, the high peaks are much, much higher than the low peaks. OK, another task that people are faced with a lot of times when they're in this kind of a situation is to try to find a homolog in another species. If you go to the top of the gene record, there is a link here to homology. There are basically two ways here of doing it. Uh, I could look at the old-fashioned database, which we call homology. Let me do that first. This gives me um, a set of sort of representative organisms. These are based on completely sequenced eukaryotic genomes. And this database is frozen at this point. But it does give me a way of getting, for example, from cow back up to human. Uh, I could do that already in another way. I'll show you that in a second. But it also gives me a little bit broader coverage. I can get to, for example, some plant genomes here. There is a, a homolog in Arabidopsis. And basically, homology tells you about the most recent common ancestor of all these organisms. So we expect to find this gene in pretty much all eukaryotes. The other way of finding homologs here, which is particularly useful if you're working with vertebrates, is to use the orthologs that we have found when we annotate these genomes. And so you can see that it says 136 organisms have orthologs with this. This is actually a search that's based on uh, the group that's orthologous with the human gene. I can add any kind of organism search to this if I want to find the corresponding matches. So I'm basically just going to put an organism search on the end of this to find those in the family Bovidae. And I can find the sheep and the goat and other members of the genus Boss, here's a wild yak. Um, there's also bison here. So you could do the same thing if you want to for other organisms of interest. OK, so the last example that I want to do, I'm going to do it fairly quickly. 
just to switch over to a plant gene. Uh, and I wanted to show you, uh, that will give me a chance to show you a geo profile. Also how to find a homolog using blast, which we could do of course with the gene that we're working with now, but I'll show you this with a plant gene. So the gene that I'm gonna work with is leafy, which is a transcription factor. And I'll show you a very useful kind of gene search here, which is this symbol combined with the name of an organism. So this looks very similar to the record we saw for cow. Um, this is a gene from Arabidopsis. Um, we have access to reference sequences and so on and so forth. The thing that we can do here that we couldn't do with cow to get very good information, there are a lot more geo profiles for uh, Arabidopsis, a uh, widely used experimental organism. I can just go here and see what one of these expression profiles look like. These basically are looking at the genes that are on a particular gene chip um, to see um, the expression level. So you're basically taking a slice across that microarray for a particular gene that's got maybe more than one probe in that microarray. Um, what you want to do to be able to use this properly is to associate it with a particular uh, geo data set, which is one of these uh, curated experiments. And so I'm just going to go ahead and use the one that on your later on, if you have some time, you might want to take a look at GDS 453, which is basically looking at mutant strains of um, Arabidopsis that have mutations in some of the genes involved in flower development. So I can just run this kind of a search in GeoProfiles to get that directly. And this shows you a GeoProfile, and it shows you um, that the wild types have much more increased expression of this leafy gene, which is involved in flower development um, over the day trials that they did here. And these are the mutant ones that have uh, mutations in genes related to flower development. Last thing I want to do, or there are two things I want to do last, and that's to go ahead and show you how to find homologs using BLAST. So what I'm going to do is go down here to the reference sequence section of the record. And I'm going to retrieve the protein record. This is the leafy gene product here. I'm going to run BLAST with that. So what I can do with BLAST to um, find the corresponding gene in another species, which is what I'm, my goal really is here, is I'm going to pick our reference sequences here. And I'm going to um, use field mustard to do this. So I'm going to try to find the corresponding gene in Brassica napa. Not Brassica napa, I'm going to find it in Brassica rapa. And I could run this search directly. Um, to save time, I'm going to go ahead and load the results. And I've saved those here. And so here is the corresponding uh, match in Brassica rapa. And from the BLAST results, I have a quick link back to the corresponding gene record um, in the gene database. So that's how you would find the plant genes because we don't have some kind of a annotation pipeline for plants for doing these kinds of things. The last thing I want to do here is just to show you how to find a structure for um, a particular protein. You can do this directly from the leafy gene, or you can do it from the protein record. You can see there's a shortcut here to the protein 3D structure. I'll take the first one here. I can, if I want to, I can just directly view the structure in uh, IC in 3D. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And so this is a transcription factor and it binds to DNA. And so you can see that there, this is a structure that has a crystal structure of the protein over here is shown as a ribbon diagram. Um, and this is sort of a cartoon of the DNA structure. And you can change the way these things look. Um, so I could, for example, color the protein by charge. 
So now the blue residues are negatively charged. I could put side chains on them if I want to. I change this to lines. And then if I want to change the way the nucleic acid structure looks, I can change that to sphere. And I can zoom in to take a look at this. One of the things you might notice that's quite obvious when you look at this is that uh, those negatively charged, um, I'm sorry, positively charged amino acids, the blue basic amino acids, are the ones that are uh, interacting there with this overall uh, negatively charged DNA structure that's bound to it. Okay, so that was a quick whirlwind tour of some of our resources. And what I want to do now is to turn this over to Ben. Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed Peter's portion of the talk. Uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, resources for really doing computational genomics on agriculture. Most of the resources I'm going to talk about are command line or Linux based. If you are not familiar with Linux and would like to be, there are many fantastic online resources. We have some videos on learning Linux. Uh, or you could turn to, say, something like Software Carpentry, which, in my personal opinion, is a fantastic way to learn Linux. All right, so the first thing I'm going to show you is an API that we've adapted for the command line called eDirect. So many of you are probably familiar with the eUtilities API, uh, where in a Perl or Python script, uh, you could script up URLs and uh, find out about lots of things. Uh, but now you can do that directly on the command line. And if you Google NCBI eDirect, uh, there's a very useful document. And it'll show you how to download a Perl script. Uh, and when you configure that Perl script in your Linux environment, then you'll be able to use eDirect on the command line. So this is an example. Granted, this example is for human. But say you wanted all protein fastase for the human FOXP2 gene, you would uh, have it actually go through there. Now, one thing many people ask uh, me for, whether they're in the metagenomics community and they're interested in plant or animal microbiomes um, or from other types of communities, is they say, Ben, I, I would like to get all the FASTA sequences uh, for a given taxonomy. And uh, one way you could do that would be to go to the Genomes FTP site, but that's a, a bit complicated. Um, but another way you could do that is uh, by using uh, this short command here, um, which basically uh, leverages eDirect. Um, and I can send this to anybody who's interested. What this does, and these slides will be available um, in just a couple of days. Um, this leverages eDirect to go ahead and um, get all of the FASTAs uh, for any particular sort of genus and species you're interested in. And of course, you can swap this bacteria in quotation marks for any particular genus uh, and or species that you're interested in. Uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, these eDirect commands, and uh, we're going to be putting a cookbook uh, most likely out on GitHub, uh, so that can be a community resource. So watch NCBI News for that. Uh, that's something I'm particularly very excited about. All right, so uh, but what I'm going to talk about for most of the rest of the webinar is next generation sequencing. So uh, I hope many of you have access to next generation sequencing, um, and uh, I'm sure many of you are probably using it to answer questions. Uh, what we're typically doing with next generation sequencing is we're taking short, uh, usually a, long, a bit longer than this now, somewhere on the order of 100 to 150 nucleotides, with about a 400 uh, base pair spacer and then a, another 100 to 150 nucleotides. We're taking these things um, and we're either assembling them or mapping them uh, to a reference genome. So uh, this is just a simple diagram of mapping, um, and uh, this shows uh, basically that uh, there are sort of two paths for this. One is mapping to a known reference genome uh, and then calling variants. And I'm going to show you how to do that with some of the stuff in our databases. And then 
also uh, there's assembly. Um, some people sort of have been asking me questions about what to do with their assemblies uh, and how to submit them to NCBI. And uh, if you're interested, what I would suggest starting with is submit.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. You can also check out previous webinars uh, that we've given on sequence submission. So if you go to our webinars page, click on the archive webinars tab, then you can actually just search for submissions and it'll pull all of those up. If you're interested uh, more in genomics and you don't know what the, the names for the different kinds of files are, we have a glossary. It's available here. Thanks to Shannon Green for her help with that. And also, uh, we have a, a basic next generation sequencing online workshop. It's really uh, sort of easy to use and there's a basic Linux uh, uh, component in that. You can find that on the NCBI YouTube channel. Uh, just, just go ahead and Google search for it. It should come up relatively easily. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where a lot of our genomic information lives. The first place I like to start if I'm looking for genomic information on a particular uh, animal or plant uh, is with BioProject. The really nice thing about BioProject, so you can search through a whole bunch of projects uh, related to your subject of interest. In this case, I picked cow. Um, but then it'll also break it down uh, by projects on different things. So for example, we have 518 transcriptome projects on cow. So that's, uh, that's something particularly interesting. Uh, it may be interesting to you. And those are divided between microarray and uh, RNA-seq. And I'll show you how specifically to get into the RNA-seq data in a couple of slides. We also have uh, quite a few epigenomics projects uh, as well as sequencing projects. So uh, things to check out. And then some, uh, we have some metagenomic data sets for cow, uh, which, I, which I would imagine many of you are very interested in. So we keep uh, our genomic data in a structure called SRA. SRA allows us to compress the data a great deal. But on the other end, for those of you who are pretty savvy, the nice thing is that you can stream the data to an endpoint. And I'll show you what I mean uh, just in the next couple of slides. Or, I'm sorry, in a few slides when I show GATK. So, Say I go to the public SRA and I search for cow, I get 13,700 results. So that means there have been 13,700 individual runs on the cow. Now, I can see two things. One, about 10,000 of those are for DNA, and about 4,000 of those are RNA-seq. So I think that's pretty exciting. There's a lot of data to go through for cow. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to show you how to go through that data uh, get into that data relatively easily. Also, there's a lot of whole genome sequence for the cow. There's not, there's not a ton of exomes. Exomes tend to be used in sort of the human clinical genomics realm, but not necessarily as much. And this will be important as we get into it. Um, some of that data is aligned, probably much of the DNA seq. So about somewhere on the order of 15% of the DNA seq data is aligned. Most of the RNA seq data and much of the DNA seq data is not aligned. Um, we can also see a breakdown by organism. So, of course, there's bovine gut metagenome. We have uh, about 1,400 uh, sequencing runs uh, from the gut metagenome and about 9,200 uh, from the cow itself. Um, some of those are going to be exomes, some of those are going to be targeted regions of the genome, and some of those are going to be whole genome. But the really nice thing. Um, when we start to uh, dig into this is say I click on the cow as an organism per se, what I can then do, and I click on aligned data, so now I'm just looking at the aligned data. I can send the results uh, to the NCBI run selector. The really nice thing is this gives me a very clear view of the metadata for these particular genomic data sets in SRA. So here I can take a look at that. And I can see, I can narrow down on all of these facets. So here, I know that there's 1,700 runs, which I showed you before in the previous slide. So there's about 1,700 runs. Sometimes there's technical replicates. That's why there's a few more here than there are in that 
1725 number, but I can narrow them down relatively quickly. So for example, if I'm only interested in whole genome sequencing in female Jersey cows, I can look at that right away. And I can see that here I have 14 aligned sequences from female Jersey cows. And I can see by the bio projects that all of these were done by the same group uh, in New Zealand, which is not particularly surprising. So why do we have SRA data structures? Well, one really nice thing is that if it is aligned, what I can do is I can just slice the things out. So here's the accession number for cow chromosome 18 uh, with the, I'm sorry, 14, with the reference that Peter was talking about earlier. Um, and here I have the region. And what this will do is simply slice out uh, a SAM file um, from the region that I'm interested in in this aligned genomic data. The other thing I can do with aligned genomic data, and I'm very, very excited about this, is that I can use GATK, which is the most popular uh, variant caller uh, in the world right now. And what I can do is I can tell it the SRRs. These particular examples are humans, but they'll work for cow too. I can tell it the SRRs I'm interested in, um, put them with dash I and then a space to the SRR. By the way, if you're confused, this is relatively advanced. So don't worry, you're probably just at an earlier stage of your bioinformatics learning. Um, I can also put uh, the reference here and it will recapitulate the reference from uh, that SRR that I give it. And that's very exciting uh, for any of you who have tried to use GATK with other people's data or public data. That's a new service we offer. And as you can see here, I get a regular VCF file. If you don't know what a VCF file is, that's okay. Uh, but please refer back to our glossary. Uh, it's variant call format and it tells you uh, what the different variants are relative uh, to the genome. It gives you a whole bunch of other information here. However, what if that data is not aligned? You know, as we saw, 85% of the DNA data wasn't aligned, almost 100% of the RNA-seq data wasn't aligned. So what do we do then? Well, what I am proud to say is now you can do BLAST. And this is very exciting to me because SRA BLAST works on both the uh, it works on both the uh, graphic user interface or the web, as well as on the command line, if you're doing a lot of BLAST searches. And when you're in SRA, if you click this send to button, it will give an option to send these runs to BLAST. But please select particular runs if you're gonna use that option. So if I were to select one and two here, open up the send to menu, I can send them to BLAST. That's something that I think is very exciting and frankly sort of democratizes genomics because anybody, I, I believe any of you are probably capable of doing a BLAST search today. And what this means is that you can do a BLAST search into unaligned next generation sequencing reads today. So if you're uh, fairly advanced, however, the other thing you can do uh, is go to GitHub and clone uh, the NGS tools repo. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. And if you do that, then you can prepend your BLAST searches with SRA search. Basically what this is, is FGREP uh, for uh, SRA. And that's something that's very exciting to me because you can search very quickly. So if you had a virus and you're interested in particular CAMERS, you wanted to search into particular genomic projects, that's something you could do very, very quickly and very, very easily. Uh, this is just showing an example. Uh, I'm, this is the just the very top of a search into the, these sort of uh, initial accession numbers for AG, ACGT. And here I can see uh, that I have these things. Uh, I can make more specific searches. And as I'm sure uh, any of you who are mathematically minded uh, will intuit that when I go out uh, to something on the order of a 14 mer search string, uh, I start to get to unique hits. So uh, that's something that I hope is useful to you guys. If you're interested in RNA-seq uh, or DNA-seq to some extent, um, we have a new type of blast we call magic blast. 
This is an NCBI optimized RNA-seq mapper. Uh, it works based on BLAST and the default output are SAM files. Once again, if you don't understand the last couple of sentences I said, uh, try to go back through and uh, work yourself through uh, our next generation sequencing workshop or somebody else's next generation sequencing workshop. And you'll understand exactly what I, what I mean by when I say that. You can grab this as a binary from our FTP site. Also, HiSat, which is a very fast mapper, which happens to be written by the Salzburg Group at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Not an endorsement, but it does work natively with SRA. I'm excited to say that pretty soon, uh, STAR, which is another very popular fast RNA-seq mapper developed at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, should also work natively with SRA. To find the SRA toolkit, you can grab it from GitHub. If you're not familiar with GitHub, that's okay. I'd encourage you, uh, in my personal opinion, again, Software Carpentry is an excellent resource for checking these things out. If you are a tool developer, check out the NGS language bindings, and you can make your tool work natively with the SRA datasets. So, uh, I had a lot of questions while Peter was talking about uh, genome annotation, and so I actually want to talk about that a little bit. I think it segues well to sort of switch off the genomics. Say you had an assembled sequence and you wanted annotation. Now, if you happen to work on bacteria, that is done automatically. So every bacterial sequence submitted to NCBI gets annotated by our prokaryotic annotation pipeline. And you'll see if there are original submitters annotations, they're in the GenBank FTP file of the assembly database. And uh, our annotations will be in the RefSeq file. For eukaryotes, not all organisms are automatically annotated by our pipeline, but if you're interested in having your organism annotated, if you've done an assembly and you're submitting it, please write an email to genomes at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. If you need that information again, uh, you can go ahead and email us at webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. For organisms where there is not a good reference sequence, um, and I know this is true for quite a few agricultural organisms, uh, you might check out the transcriptome shotgun assembly base, database. There are millions of assembled sequences in there at this point. And this is something that's very exciting to me. Maybe you have a strange organism which uh, doesn't have a reference or it has high GC content or there's a lot of repeated elements you can still most likely find assembled RNA uh, in this database and, and do the work that you need to do. So I think, I think that's something that's very helpful to the community. And if you're doing RNA assembly yourself, please consider submitting to this particular database. I think, once again, I think this database is very helpful to the community. Finally, we have uh, a tool called MoleBlast. If you're just getting into the metagenomic space, uh, you can use this, um, particularly for things like 16S, uh, to go ahead and make operational taxonomic units. In other words, clusters of the sequencing sequences you're seeing uh, in your metagenomic sample. That said, I want to caution you, and I've talked to community members about this, this is a very approximate tool. Uh, really appropriate for first pass analysis. If you need to do deeper analysis, please do some research on metagenomic tools that make more refined OTUs. So to get more information, as I've mentioned a couple of times, one quick way is to search uh, webinars and courses, and there's a very, very fast search, very easy to use search here on our webinars page. And also, if you go into our documentation from the NCBI Learn page, pretty much for every single one of our resources, there is help and you can get to it. Bankit 
is our new submission system. It's something that the uh, submission folks are very proud of. I encourage you to take a look at it. As you can see, this is an alphabetical order. So you can go look in many, many other things. So that said, I am sure there are a number of questions. I see Peter Cooper across the table from me typing relatively furiously. We have about five minutes to take questions, and then we're going to have to go ahead and hang up the webinar. That said, uh, if your question is not answered and you have a substantive question that's hanging out there, we'll try to get it up on the FTP site in the next couple of days. So check back here, uh, and we'll try to go ahead and answer your question. Go to meeting is telling me it's time for the next meeting, but like I said, uh, we're going to take uh, questions for about five minutes. There'll be a little bit of background noise. I'm going to hand this microphone to Peter Cooper, and for widely applicable substantive questions, he's going to ask the question and then either answer it himself, or I'm going to go ahead and answer it. I think we have time for one or two questions. All right, so I guess Peter uh, has answered pretty much all of your questions, as far as I know. Um, if you have more questions, if questions occur to you later on, no problem. Please just go ahead and ping webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov or info, I-N-F-O, at uh, ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. I really hope this has been an informative and worthwhile hour for you. Also, if you have ideas on other webinars or would like more explanation on any particular resources that we outline in this webinar, please also uh, send a note to uh, webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. With that, uh, I hope you all have a fantastic day. Uh, for those of you in the United States, Happy Thanksgiving, and um, take care.